Hello, and welcome to Praxis and Theodicy. Today, I want to talk about mutual aid and social shalom. I want to highlight a section from the book Generous Justice by Timothy Keller. It's an easy book to read and makes some pretty good, if not incredibly rigorous, arguments for the cause of Christianity to refocus its efforts on ensuring the well-being of marginalized people and people groups. The word shalom in Hebrew conveys a sense of completeness. It often translates as peace in English Bibles, and that is meant to convey the peace that comes from complete, rightly ordered things something that has everything it needs and is operating in a healthy, optimal manner. When all the parts are in place, they serve each other, and it all works together. But when just one component isn't working in harmony, the whole operation can break down. Shalom can refer to many things, but we'll focus on social shalom, that is, the health, harmony, and completeness of human societies. When the society disintegrates, when there is crime, poverty, and family breakdown, there is no shalom. However, when people share their resources with each other and work together so that shared public services work, the environment is safe and beautiful, the schools educate, and the businesses flourish, then that community is experiencing social shalom. When people with advantages invest them in those who have fewer, the community experiences civic prosperity and social shalom. I also want to talk about a related concept from the field of anthropology and politics, that of mutual aid. Mutual aid is, simply stated, the tendency in human nature towards cooperation and of valuing others in society as much as or more than one's individual self. In his book, Mutual Aid, A Factor in Evolution, Peter Kropotkin outlines the concept by describing how, in a society influenced by a strong culture of mutual aid, The total abandonment of the idea of revenge is affirmed more and more vigorously. The higher concept of freely giving more than one expects to receive from his neighbors is proclaimed as being the real principle of morality. This should sound familiar to a Christian audience, since Jesus Christ had something remarkably similar to say. With this short introduction to mutual aid and its shared understanding with the teachings of Christ, I want to highlight this passage from Generous Justice, which describes a working institution of natural mutual aid, which Keller identifies as a healthy outpouring of social shalom. An intriguing real-life example of an entire community doing justice and seeking shalom is laid out in Yale professor Nora Ellen Croce's book, Everyone Here Spoke Sign Language. In the 1980s, Croce was researching hereditary deafness on Martha's Vineyard. In the 17th century, the original European settlers were all from a region in Kent, England called the Weald, where there was a high incidence of hereditary deafness. Because of their geographical isolation and intermarriage, the percentage of deaf people increased across the whole island. By the 19th century, one out of 25 people in the town of Chilmark was deaf, and in another small settlement, near a quarter of the people could not hear. In most societies, physically handicapped people are forced to adapt to the life patterns of the non-handicapped, but that is not what happened on the vineyard. One day, Croce was interviewing an older island resident, and she asked him what the hearing people thought of the deaf people. We didn't think anything about them, they were just like everyone else, he replied. Croce responded that it must have been necessary for everyone to write things down on paper in order to communicate with them. The man responded with surprise. No, you see, everyone here spoke sign language. The interview asked if he meant the deaf people's families. No, he answered, everybody in town. I used to speak it, my mother did, everybody. Another interviewee said, those people weren't handicapped, they were just deaf. One other remembered, they were like anybody else. I wouldn't be overly kind because they'd be sensitive to that. I'd just treat them the way I treated anybody. Indeed, What had happened was that an entire community had disadvantaged itself en masse for the sake of a minority. Instead of making the non-hearing minority learn to read lips, the whole hearing majority learned signing. All the hearing became bilingual, so deaf people were able to enter into full social participation. 
As a result of doing justice, disadvantaging themselves, the majority experienced shalom. It included people in the social fabric who in other places would have fallen through it. When they had socials or anything up in Chilmark, why, everybody would go and they enjoyed it just as much as anybody did. They used to have fun. We all did. They were part of the crowd. They were accepted. They were fishermen and farmers and everything else. Sometimes, if there were more deaf people than hearing there, everyone would speak sign language. Just to be polite, you know? Deafness, as a handicap, largely disappeared. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of Croce's research was the revelation of how hearing people had their own communication abilities enhanced. They found many uses for signing besides communication with the deaf. Children signed to one another during sermons in church or behind a teacher's back at school. Neighbors could sign to one another over distances in a field or even through a spyglass telescope. One woman remembers how her father would be able to stand on a windy cliff and sign his intentions to fishermen below. Another remembers how sick people, who could not speak, were able to sign to make their needs known. In other words, the disadvantage that the hearing vineyarders assumed, the effort and trouble to learn another language, turned out to be for their benefit after all. Their new abilities made life easier and more productive. They changed their culture in order to include an otherwise disadvantaged minority, but in the process made themselves and their society richer. Martha's Vineyard was a unique situation. However, in every time and culture, the principle holds. The strong must disadvantage themselves for the weak, the majority for the minority, or the community frays and the fabric breaks. Especially interesting to me was the note that mutual aid and social shalom must be practiced with a heart of sacrifice, of giving more than you expect to receive in return. And yet, it results in benefits for all people, not just the disadvantaged in society. Kropotkin demonstrates this throughout his book, summing it up by highlighting that the periods when institutions based on the mutual aid tendency took their greatest development were also the periods of the greatest progress in arts, industry, and science. It is no wonder that Christ preached this way of life as the basis for his kingdom, for the body of believers, for the family of God. <laughs>